Greetings, noble ones. And today I'd like to make a video on the evolution of knightly armor from the late 11th century to the late 15th century. Now, of course, this is going to be a huge, massive, enormous topic, so I can't go as much into details as I would like to. But this video will be a quick reference for all of you who are studying medieval history and particularly iconography regarding uh, knights in the knightly class. And through this video, at the end of this video, you should be able to look at a set of armor or look at a knight or a representation of a knight and immediately pinpoint that specific set or that specific knight to a date. So either like, for example, end of the 12th century, early 13th, late 14th century and so on. So let's get to it. We shall begin from the 11th century. Now, the uh, Bayeux Tapestry is, of course, the most uh, important uh, piece of iconography that we have of this period. When we look at an 11th century knight, a late 11th century knight, and first off, of course, the main protection is going to be male. And male will remain a predominant uh, armor throughout the uh, first centuries of, of the Middle Ages, but we will get to that in a moment. So, the, there is a difference between the male worn by the 11th century knight, and, for example, the male worn by a 12th century knight, and so forth. In the 11th century, what we see is, first off, what they, the knights are wearing is a hauberk. So it's it's a full length and rather uh, long uh, garment made of riveted male armor and which has a rider's split which is used to allow the knight to mount his horse. The uh, sleeves of the male in this century tend to reach the three quarters of the arm. Now what's interesting is that the protection for the head, yes it's a male coif, but the male coif in this century is going to be integral with the hauberk. So in other words, the um, coif is part of the male, it's not a separate object that will be a later invention. On top of the male coif, the knights of this period will be wearing a nasal helm, a conical nasal helm. As we reach the 12th century, we have to differentiate between the knights of the early 12th century and the knights of the late 12th century. In the early 12th century, well, the first difference that we see with 11th century knights is that the male is starting to cover more and more. The sleeves are, are now protecting the entirety of the arm up to the wrist. In early 12th century iconography, we see that the hands are unprotected. Also, an important thing to notice is that the male protecting the arms always tapers at the wrist. So no baggy, oversized male protection for the arms. Not historically. So what about the nasal helm? Well, the nasal helm will run out of favour of the upper echelon of the army, the knightly class, um, towards the end of the 12th century. It doesn't mean that no one is going to use it though. There will still be some knights who will use it because of its uh, ability, of the vi visibility that the helmet gives. It, so it does have some advantages. But mostly knights will now start preferring uh, more protection. In fact, we have the first development of actual plates uh, protecting the face, which are the first early developments towards what will become in the future a great helm. What's also interesting to say is that the 12th century nasal helm will also have some uh, different possible shapes. Uh, we will have rounded skulls and sometimes skulls protruding towards the front of the helmet. The 12th century is an important date because we also have the implementation of the surcoat, the garment worn over male to protect male and for heraldic display. And this is also something that will be used by knight, the Knights Crusaders. We'll choose white specifically, at least at first, and then you have different orders of course, and I have dedicated videos to the Crusader orders. But at first it will be white because white will not only protect male from the weather, but it will also protect it from direct sunlight. Still towards the end of the 12th century we see protection for the hands in mail. But again, these will be divided into two versions, the actual individual fingered gauntlets, which will still be part, integral part of the sleeve of the mail, and the, the actual mittens. Out of the two, the latter will be more constant in iconography. 
So what happens to Arma in the 13th century? 13th century is where things start to become more complex. We have a lot of experimentation. Beginning with the early 13th century, you have to consider the fact that, yes, male is still the main and prevalent component of, uh, of the armor of a knight. Now, the helmet in the early 13th century, we have the first early examples of great helm. In the mid 13th century, we have the fully enclosed and fully developed flat top great helm. It's a very iconographic image. And when we reach the end of the 13th century, then you have the invention of the sugar loaf, which is interesting because it's a great helm which has a more conical shape, a more rounded surface to encourage weapons to glance off upon impact. Uh, whereas with a flat top, you can imagine that much of that force will be direct redirected on the spine of the wearer. Now, what's interesting about the, uh, this is that if you think about it, the idea of or the concept of a rounded shape similar to the sugar loaf that we find in the in late 13th century great helms was already present at the times of the nasal helm. So we are sort of going back again and we don't really know why uh, the early great helmets were, had a flat top and personally as far as the looks are concerned I really like flat top great helms and in fact I am getting a flat top great helm for my 13th century armor and they coexisted it's not like that when the sugar loaf uh, helmets great helms appeared the flat tops disappeared no they coexisted together for some time until the flat top helmets became uh, where went out of fashion now the great helm of this time the great helm of the 13th century is a standalone helmet now this will be different in the 14th century but we will get there as we are proceeding in uh, chronological order so please consider that in at this time the great helm is a standalone helmet that you would normally wear on top of a male coif or some form of padding Still talking helmets, it is by the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 13th century that we also have the development of the kettle hat. So you can, when you see that sort of helmet, you can immediately place it either end of the 12th century or beginning of the 13th. So we have seen the mail, we have seen the helmet, what happens in the 13th century as far as the protection of the hands is concerned. And again we need to differentiate between early 13th century and late 13th century because in early 13th century, century the protection of the hands was the same as the late 12th century one, so male predominantly. Whereas when we reach the late 13th century then they start, uh, the armorers start experimenting with plates and we have the beginning of the first uh, examples of plate gauntlets. For example, the Visby style, which is again plate, but it's riveted on, on top of textile or a garment uh, to give it its structure. And as we move forward in the 14th century, the plate will become an actual, you will have an actual standalone uh, plate gauntlet. But in the 13th century, towards the late 13th century, we have the first experimentation with plate protection for the hands. For the protection of the legs, in the early 13th century we have already male protecting the legs, but normally it's just protecting the front and it's, it has only lacing at the back, so you don't have fully all-round male in the legs in the early 13th century, but only uh, protecting the front. It is in the late 13th century that you have fully enclosed uh, legs protected in male. And again, still towards the end of the 13th century, they also start experimenting with half cannons or actual uh, half greaves or demi-greaves made of plate to protect the front of the shin. Now another very important element in, on, as far as the 13th century is concerned is what it's called a coat of plates. A coat of plates is the first experimentation of using plate to supplement mail, meaning that you're still wearing mail armor underneath, you still have your mail hauberk, but on top of that you have your surcoat, which we know was developed in the 12th century, but now the coat of plates is basically, at least the early examples are, Surcoats which also include plates riveted inside, many plates riveted inside, the number varies greatly, enormously. So that makes the uh, circuit not from a only a heraldic or weather protection garment into an actual element of armor. We will have many different kinds, we will have many different shapes.
Now, as we move in the 14th century, uh, what happens is that things start to become shorter. So the Hoburg becomes a Hobergian, and also the surcoat becomes shorter. Of course, we will still have coat of plates, and that is one of the reasons why sometimes you only wear a male in those areas that are not covered by plate. But what's interesting to see is that in the 14th century, we have a constant growth in the amount of plate used. So from in, where, when in the early 14th century, we see, for example, rondella, we see smaller elements, like again, late 13th, early 14th century, you have the very small uh, plate shoulders or spaulders protecting uh, here rather than just a basically a disc. It, that's of course an evolution, but again, we will have very small elements of plate protecting only the only certain sections of the arm to reinforce like for example even a kneecap uh, protecting only the knee with plate and and the rest will still remain male but as we move forward into the mid uh, 14th century we see the experimentation with uh, protection for the limbs in plate and at this time they are still partial protection so we have uh, as i said half greaves demi greaves we have protection of only the front, for example, of the forearm and that sort of invention until we reach the late 14th century. In late 14th century is where plate starts to become uh, one of the most important components in the armor of a knight. So we have full plate, all round protection for the legs or leg har harness with complete greaves and the same can be said for the armor. Now, styles will change depending on whether we're talking about English armor, whether we're talking Italian armor. Sometimes, and again, in the 14th century, the Italians did not wear spaulders, depending on, again, what iconography we look, and they would just keep this part protected by mail and then having all this arm protected by plate, whereas the English would normally um, have the spaulder attached to the harness and then suspended. There are lots of different possible combinations, of course, but suffice to say for this video that if you see a knight with full uh, arms in plate and full legs in plate, but still wearing a surcoat on top of his cuirass, then it is a late 14th century knight. Now, interestingly enough, I did mention cuirass now. Yes, because the late 14th century is where we had the development of the breastplate. So breastplate, we mean a solid armor protecting, uh, made of plate, protecting the torso, not always the back though. For the back, we do need to reach into the early 15th century for a breastplate and backplate combination. Again, in the late 14th century, we do see that some uh, early cuirasses start to protect the back a little bit or maybe the sides. And as this continues to proceed towards the full protection of the back, we will find ourselves in the early 15th century. So an interesting thing to say is that in late 14th century armor, we still have the usage of great helm. And, and in the mid middle of the 14th century, we also have the first development of the bassin it, which will have so many different variants and so many different possible visors, but maybe the most uh, famous one is the hound skull, which is a late 14th century sort of um, bassinet. But what's interesting is that the great helm of the late 14th century is not a standalone helmet anymore, but it's a helmet that you wear together with either a um, secret helm or a uh, servalier, which is a smaller low profile helmet which only covers this part of the head, or eventually you will actually wear the great helm with a bassinet. And a good example of, of this, a great helm used in combination with another helmet, a smaller helmet underneath it, is the Black Prince uh, armor, which is a definitely late 14th century uh, kind of knight using still the, the Great Helm. But as you see, the Great Helm now doesn't have a flat top anymore. It only has a sugar loaf, and that is because underneath it's got a, another helmet. So you do need to, to take into consideration this sort of combination as far as sizes are concerned. So we can say that when you see a very big Great Helm, then you are looking at a late 14th century Great Helm. Another big difference between the coat of plates and corazzina of the late 13th century and mid 14th century and the actual late 14th century um, breastplates is the fact that uh, late 14th century breastplates are not flat, they're global, and they also tend to taper at the waist and this is why we see the sort of wasp uh, waist typical of late 14th century silhouette of a knight. 
Now, before moving to the 15th century, which actually happens to be my favorite century as far as the Knight Alma is concerned, I'd like to underline the fact that in the 14th century, the early development of, uh, coat, of the coat of plates into the actual uh, sort of uh, corazzina or solid breastplate that with folds that will be the predecessor of the late 14th century breastplate will be permanently attached at first to some sort of fabric. And this is the big difference. And I think it's interesting because if you think about it, at first we have, well, of course, we have the circuit, so the concept of covering the armor. Then the uh, solid breastplate is developed, but they actually attach permanently the fabric onto it. So it's sort of still coming back with this culture, idea and fashion of covering the armor. But then as we reach the 15th century, we have the exposed armor and it's a completely different fashion. So when you see the end of surcoats, and I will give you the date of this, but when you see the end of surcoats and, the, and you also see the end of textile being uh, permanently attached to armor, and that is a typical 15th century look. Okay, so now we are in the 15th century, and this is a, again, as I said, my fa favorite period, but it's also a period with a huge amount of variation. But let's see if I can manage to encapsulate all of this information into a short presentation. Now, the first thing we should say is that, as I said, we have in the 15th century the beginning of the uncovered armor. And also, male now is only, we have what's called the voiders, so basically male, which is, or discrete male, which is, um, sewn directly onto your arming doublet, which is the sort of garment, padded garment that you wear underneath the plate, and you only have a male protecting those areas that are usually not covered by plate. Now, again, depending on what area, whether it's an English knight, a German knight, an Italian knight, things will change, and Italians will keep on wearing male, the full-length male shirt underneath their plate, um, even uh, in the 15th century, in, in, with some uh, exceptions of course, but, but it is in 1420 that we have the development of the full plate armor. So now you have breastplate, backplate and fold. In fact, the data that I was mentioning before, 1420 to 1485 is called the circuitless period. So we know now that full plate armor is a 15th century, so when we, uh, well, sort of second decade of the uh, 15th century all the way to the late 15th century, that sort of time frame which uh, can help us picture this, but that doesn't mean that there was the only kind of armor available. The brigandine is now developing to the 15th century sort of brigandine, uh, which is made of many very small plates and it closes at the front, which is completely different from the closure of, or from the closing method or fastening method of breastplate. Early brigandines would close at the back, 15th century brigandines tend to close at the front because it's easier to put on and, and you can fasten it yourself. You know that, of course, um, the upper echelons of the army, the actual royal noble knights will always have servants who will take care of their armor, polish their armor and then help them put it on. In fact, full plate armor, you cannot wear it by yourself. And when I say this, I mean practically, okay? Yes, maybe someone on YouTube could one day come up with a very weird method and historical to manage to wear the entirety of the full plate harness by himself but that's not historical and the knights did not do it because it would be incredibly difficult and it would take a lot of time so if you need to wear full plate armor you need someone to assist you and the nobles definitely did have servants to help them out as far as the protection for the hands is concerned in the middle of the 14th century we have the development of the hourglass uh, gauntlet, uh, the plate gauntlet that I talked about with this sort of shape protecting the wrist and that will remain uh, until the middle of the 15th century as well and it was still in use but again in the 15th century you also have the development of the plate mittens so when you see this sort of gauntlet then you know that for a 14th century knight that sort of gauntlet would be anachronistic and it would be futuristic it's a 15th century invention which grants better protection um, but losing some mobility or ability to do fine tasks. 
Now, when talking 15th century, it's impossible not to talk about the two main styles of armor of the 15th century, which are the Northern Italian or Milanese style and the Southern German Gothic style. And this, uh, these will be the two main kinds of armor in the 15th century. And the main differences are, I have a video actually dedicated to this, but to very quickly talk about this, a um, Gothic style, you first off, you see fluting, whereas in a Milanese style, you see rounded and smooth uh, surface. Surfaces. And then Gothic will have smaller spaulders or pauldrons, whereas uh, the Italian style will favor bigger pauldrons and sometimes asymmetrical pauldrons, as I have mentioned many times, which are indeed my favorite style. Go Northern Italian. And I really like the uh, sort of, and of course, if you have a bigger pauldron, it will be the left one because this is your line of defense when you fight, whereas your smaller pauldron will be the right one because you need to be able to operate your weapon. Um, and have more mobility in this articulation here. It is also through the helmets that we see a huge difference and differentiation in the 15th century. We have the birth of the first salad, for example, which originates in Italy and then will spread throughout Europe and it will become universal in Germany eventually. Although there is a difference between an Italian salad, as you can see, with a smaller um, tail and more rounded surfaces and a German salad, which has a longer tail, eventually which will become even articulated or segmented to allow better mobility and many different uh, variants as far as the actual visor is concerned whether it be a separate visor or whether it be a visor integral to the skull lots of different possibilities but of course the salad is particularly in Germany will be uh, worn with a bever so this is one possible way to protect your head if you're if you wear a 15th century knight but we have others what's interesting to see is that the great helm it's not that it it completely disappeared it just evolved into the frog mouth the frog mouth is a tournament helmet and a cavalry only helmet now occasionally was used also in battle in its early forms but the final development of the frog mouth the massive huge helmet which could be attached to the breastplate uh, will be a tournament only sort of helmet and if you're interested in the topic of jousting i do have a video which i made a long time ago but i will leave a link in the description below and the reason why you would attach these sort of very you know these massive helmets to your breastplate is to make sure that if you were to be hit by a lance then your head would not snap to the side but it would be secure in place and of course you have this massive plate of protection here um, so this is the frog mouth a later evolution of the great helm but we do have other possibilities the armet has a different way of opening you open these two uh, cheek plates like this in order for the helmet to fit the head and then be closed and the armet again can be reinforced particularly if you are talking about cavalry with a very ingenious italian invention which is the wrapper a, a new element of plate which is attached and then secured at the back of the helmet sometimes using a sort of rondella that you will find there uh, to put and not only to keep the, the straps, the leather straps in place, but also to protect them from possible cuts to secure extra element of protection for the face. And at the same time, Italian will start looking at the ancient classical times, particularly Greece, and they will sort of make a late 15th century version of the Corinthian helmet, which is called Barbuta or Barbute, uh, which, as you can see, it's a form of open helmet. Of course, you lose some protection in the face, but you will gain uh, visibility and ability to breathe. And as always, a knight could choose the, uh, the sort of fashion of protection he wanted, uh, depending on whether he wanted more protection, more mobility, etc. Now another thing that happens in the 15th century is a double layer of protection in your very core which is achieved through both the breastplate which as you know terminates where your navel is in order to permit mobility and the conjunction of the placket. Now the placket is a different solution to the fold which we have seen already in the 14th century because the fold yes it articulates and it allows movement but the placket is interesting because it's a solid plate which actually as the 15th century continues will start getting larger and larger and will offer two layers of protection which will still allow you to move and have full mobility of your torso regardless. Now in Italy, differently from Germany for example, 
will uh, continue, the Italians will continue to use the middle um, leather strap to secure, to attach the placket and the breastplate. Now, of course, the first thing when you see that is, well, couldn't people cut it? That is a good question, but the Italians used it for over a hundred years. So I think that if they did, it means that it worked and it wasn't as easy to cut it as one might think. Okay, so this is the sort of video that I wanted to make today. I hope that I was, it wasn't too confusing and that I could manage to sort of help you out, understand better how to place a knight and how to date it and how the evolution of plate armor in the Middle Ages in Europe worked. If you want to have a lot of details about these topics, check out my friend Ian Laspina's channel, Knight Herent, because he goes into massive amount of details and he always backs up everything with iconography. Very intelligent and very well learned man and I strongly suggest you to watch his content also because I myself watch his content and he has helped me in the making of this video by answering a few questions that I asked him for things that I wasn't sure myself. So definitely a man to go as far as European armor is concerned. If you like this video, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. I will see you tomorrow for my next daily upload. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. <laughs>